Hello, Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, we are here in Stockholm, Sweden, at the headquarters of uh, Scania. In, uh, it is in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, which has changed uh, the world and, of course, changed the company like Scania as well. Uh, it's quite empty here today. Uh, around 52,000 employees we have around the world, and, and half of them uh, is now actually at home on short-term leave. Uh, but of course, the, then we're trying to uh, help out in society. So many of our colleagues, they are currently working in other factories to, to build uh, ventilators and other equipment for the hospitals to gear up uh, the capacity, but also helping out in providing procurement and logistics for sourcing to our hospitals in Sweden. Trying to be a global citizen uh, as a company in, in the world today. Of course, this immediate crisis that we are facing is uh, underlying of that, that we have also an, a more long-term crisis that is creeping in on us. Uh, and uh, Elaine and myself, we have uh, decided to, to write the book because we believe that there is an emergency on the planet Earth. And, and um, that is the, the sustainability crisis and, and that business can actually do something about it. And we have taken a Swedish perspective uh, with a little bit of Scandinavian touch. Um, because we believe that there is something that we can uh, learn from uh, from Sweden. And, Don't forget and, the secret sauce. And the secret sauce, yeah, we call it that. Uh, that is sort of like the, the untangible things in the Swedish society that's also affecting Swedish corporate life, uh, the way we work with values uh, and, and, and principles and, 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 and uh, also how close we are to nature, but also the, the leadership styles and, and uh, with the delegate responsibility consensus, how that is influencing the whole society and of course also the corporate uh, world. But uh, Elaine, tell us a little bit more about this book. Okay, I'll start with the book title, yeah. which is a tongue twister. <laughs> it's called Sustainability Leadership, a Swedish approach to changing your company, the industry and the world. That's and, a long title. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and in the book, we, um, we, we took a, I think, quite unique approach. We tried to do two things. One, when it comes back to that secret sauce, we wanted mm. to talk to our peers in, in the industry. And we interviewed, I think, about 25 experts, uh, business leaders ranging from the large industrial companies like Electrolux and, of course, Scania, but also um, startups like Karma and Trine, and as other industry leaders like Telia and Sweco, to name a few. Mm. And um, so we're capturing a unique compilation of these different voices, but we also created a model together. Yeah. And um, the model is for not just Swedes, but any company <laughs> anywhere um, that wants to go down a sustainability journey. And, and there's three parts to the model, or three phases. In the first phase, we call the foundation. And this is really about knowing your own footprint, um, establishing guidelines, and putting a stake in the ground and making it clear what you stand for when it comes to business ethics, for mm -hmm. example. But it's also um, quite a bit about leadership, and it's about tying your purpose together with your culture and your values in creating this sustainability DNA, as we call it in the book, mm. to make sure it's all tying together. So that's the first part of the model. That's like the basics. The yeah. basics. Mm. The second phase of the model is called the core. And this is about embedding sustainability in everything you do in all the ways that you work within a company, starting with R&D through mm. production, um, the way you source products. Sales. Sales, yeah. <laughs> including sales and how you engage with your customer. And, um, and the third part is called the leap. And this is, I think, our favorite part. Yeah, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> and the magic. And the leap is really about um, setting a bolder vision and really going for it as a leader and, and using your personal leadership platform as a way to uh, galvanize the troops around you and going further in, in not just having your footprint in order, but really thinking about how will you transform your industry and even the world. And what legacy you're going to leave as and, a leader. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a perfect segue back to you, Henrik, to talk about how you see the leap from taking the leap from a Scania perspective. Yeah, and, and I think Scania is one of the examples uh, throughout the book. And, and uh, of course, Scania, we, we are um, a company that is trying to push and, and, and drive the shift towards a more sustainable transport uh, system. 
We uh, believe a lot that you have to build in sustainability into the core of the company. Um, even if we are a hard to abate industry, we represent close to 20% of the CO2 emissions in the world. That is the transport ecosystem. Um, there's still a lot of things that we can do. And, and uh, I think throughout the book, we are sharing some of the, the examples of, of how that can, uh, can happen. Very much with science as, as a backdrop and, and, and a sort of a cornerstone in, in using science as, as the, the foundation. Uh, but there's a lot of good other examples in the book. We have Northvolt, a, a Swedish startup uh, that is now building the greenest battery factory on planet, uh, providing the automotive industry. Interesting to see how they are building in sustainability into their values from day one and how that is shaping all the decisions, uh, including the stakeholders of investors. Uh, and, and uh, people working in the company. But also Houdini, uh, a outdoor wear company that you will hear more about on the panel Did later on. Did you get a power hoodie? Yeah, the hoodies there, <laughs> uh, the beautiful clothes. But uh, I mean, they, they I think are a shining example in the book of gone very far when it comes to the leap, the third part of, of the journey and how they have integrated even thoughts around planetary boundaries together with Stockholm Resilience center uh, in, in how to build in uh, sort of new lenses on, on how to look upon their world into their business strategy. But it's not only about best practices, there's also about sort of the, the next leap when it comes to sustainability, which is probably digital. Yeah, that's right. We, we think that um, we also need to be thinking about the next sustainability frontier as, as we go on as companies. And, and one of the really challenging areas will be digitalization because as we know digitalization pervades every part of our society our work life our home life our homes are connected our kids are connected everything's connected which is of course amazing and and will be probably one of the most important um, accelerators of sustainable transformation so we're very mm. pro digitalization but we also think that we also should be thinking about the other side of the coin which comes in terms of um, privacy intrusion and the use of data and digital how digital pollution digital pollution is yeah. the term we talk about and really needing to know uh, what those risks are because it's it's a you know new area for many companies um, companies are typically digitalizing in order to find efficiency gains or create new revenue streams but we're saying there's a third piece of that pie and that's that we also need to think about what's the impact on people in society and take um, steps to ensure that that's a positive impact and not the negative one because we want all those great things that Microsoft will tell us on the mm. panel when it comes to uh, saving the planet with AI and we also you know even if we come back to the pandemic which um, you started in the beginning there's a lot of apps, health apps, tracing, um, playing a vital role in contract tra tracing and that kind of thing for the pandemic. But we also need to know how is that health data, personal data going to be stored, used in the future and make sure that we're building in privacy protection. So it's not all doom and gloom, but we think there's a, a level of responsibility where we need to see more companies step up. But there's also a good example in the book about Telia. Uh, Telia is working with data insights with cities in Sweden and one of the big bets Telia is making is that um, preserving, helping to preserve privacy rather than exploiting it will, play, will pay off as a trust premium in the long run. And so we, we describe a, in detail a great case about how Telia is um, working on that from a product development point of view. Coming back to um uh, the current situation, I think the, the pandemic that we are experiencing now is a wake-up call. Uh, and I think when we are able to restart the economy and restart society, uh, we have a golden opportunity to do, do that in a sustainable way. Uh, to make sure that the foundation we're building, all the decisions, all the investments, everything we do should be based on sustainability. It is all about leadership at the end of the day, and I think that is what's described in the book. Uh, it starts and ends with leadership. And we hope that uh, when we're going to do this restart, that it's going to be more sustainable in society. If you're a leader in the corporate world or if you're a leader in general, uh, this book could be a helpful tool for you and give you some inspiration. Uh, if you have the ambition to change your company, uh, to change your industry, and to change the world.
and the book will be available in September. But for now, we'd love everyone to join us in the panel where we're going to hear from some of the business leaders that feature in the book and hear about some of the big, bold goals that uh, business leaders are taking already today. Henrik and I just finished writing a book about corporate sustainability leadership in Sweden. And we heard a rumor, or rather we're starting a rumor, that there might be some kind of secret sauce to sustainability in the Nordics. So that's going to be the focus of our panel today. And we're going to hear about how some of the companies we interviewed and some of the experts um, will share their perspectives on just what's happening here in the Nordics. And we have a great panel with us today. Uh, we have uh, Oswald Bieland uh, with us, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Sinteo. Uh, we have Eva Carlson with us, who's the CEO of uh, Houdini. We also have Kimberly Lane uh, Matheson with us, who's the general manager for Microsoft in uh, Norway. So we think we're going to have a lot of uh, interesting input coming in from those panelists today. And, and I will ask them to just briefly introduce themselves uh, for one minute uh, and, and their company. And if we uh, start with uh, you, Eva. Yes, happy to be joining. Uh, my name is Eva and I work for Houdini Sportswear, which is a Swedish outdoor brand. Uh, we, we work on 20 markets worldwide um, and create products that brings us out in the backcountry. Um, and uh, we've been working with sustainability for more than 30 years, actually, and it's is an integral part in everything we do at Sudini. Okay, thank you, Eva. And if we go over to, uh, to Norway then, uh, where we have uh, Oswald. Thank you very much, Henrik. My name is Oswald Bieland. I'm the founder of uh, and CEO of Sinteo, and we focus on sustainable growth for large multinational companies uh, in the US, Europe, and India. Okay, thank you, Oswald. And, and in Norway, we also have uh, Kimberly sitting in Oslo. Hello, everyone. Kimberly Line Matisson. I'm the general manager for Microsoft in Norway, but here representing the Nordics. Microsoft is a, a large cloud based technology platform. We build our platforms so that any number of companies of any size anywhere in the world can build their technology on our platform. Up here in the Nordics, we have a, a pretty big footprint we're proud of over 2,000 people. Um, working directly for us. That's also 50,000 people plus employed by our partners, but working directly with our technology. We have a quantum research center up here in Denmark. We have two global development centers, one in Oslo and one in, uh, in Denmark as well. And we have a data center footprint, our two large regions open in Norway already, and we're building in Sweden. So we have a lot going on. And with that footprint, sustainability is, is high on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much, Kimberly. So I think we'll kick off and, and go into uh, a couple of more uh, deep dive questions. And, and I would like to start with uh, asking you, Eva. I mean, uh, uh, learning a little bit and understanding uh, more about Houdini in, in, uh, in the research we have done and also from the book that uh, Elaine was referring to, I think it's, it's clear to see that you have really built uh, uh, sustainability into your business model. And, and I think you have even pushed it that far that you have introduced planetary boundaries uh, into your uh, strategy. Can can you share some thoughts on that with us, Eva? Yes, I think um, maybe the the, the reasons uh, for um, for having sustainability at, really at the core of everything we do. Uh, there are several, but I would like to start just by saying that it's it seems to me intuitive in the way we work. And at least two reasons that I'd like to share is, first of all, um, our ambition is really to create value for all. And we don't see, um, we don't even understand how business could have a lesser of an ambition in terms of creating value for only a few at the expense of others. So in that sense, creating value for all that takes um, a systemic approach to sustainability and that social, ethical, and environmental sustainability. And it sounds maybe like um, a negative approach, but for us, it's really been the way we 
develop our business, the, the way we look upon our potential to, to do more, create more value for our customers, ourselves, but also to the world. So, and then the second part is having yeah. core values that truly form keel and rudder for everything we do. It's, we say that we want to do good, play hard, push boundaries and have fun. And, and pushing boundaries, that's a lot about uh, progressing, questioning ourselves in the way we've been working, but also questioning conventions in society and uh, making sure that we always evolve. It's a living system and we're part of it and we have to evolve and make sure that uh, we stay interconnected and uh, learn and also share. So, yeah, that, those are two, at least two examples of why yeah. I think it's intuitive for us. Can you can you just share also that uh, um, you, you work too closely together with science? We know also and, and, and thought about sort of planetary boundaries. Can you just briefly sort of mention uh, how, how that came up? Yes, uh, to have a, a science-based uh, framework to lean against, uh, to truly understand our impact as a company now, and understand that at, a, uh, at the systemic level so that we also can understand how to improve. That was uh, That is essential, essential, of course, and we could never do that uh, by ourselves, but to to collaborate with the uh, actual earth system scientists was um, a step we took in 2015 and uh, an amazing step because uh, it gave us a lot of insight uh, a roadmap ahead and um, i think it also helped us become much more creative mm, okay thank you very much uh, eva we'll come back to you later on but uh, i'll move over then to you oswald um I mean, uh, there is a lot of challenges that uh, we're facing today. We have the COVID pandemic, and then we have, of course, the, the climate change uh, that has been ongoing for a long time. Uh, and I think you've been an advocate for sort of um, unprecedented leadership and how you create change. And you have also been in the forefront when it comes to uh, creating influencing platforms. Uh, could, you, could you share us a little bit of uh, why you thought of those things from the beginning and, and, and how you have developed that over time? Yeah, thank you very much, Henrik. First uh, of all, uh, congratulations and thank you for taking the initiative uh, to write the book. Um, I think that the Nordics uh, has a lot to offer, actually, if you look at the uh, industrial practices in in uh, across the countries. Um, we have uh, experienced crisis before. I remember as a young man, uh, Black Monday, 1997. We have seen 9-11, uh, we have seen uh, many of these uh, challenges. Um, what we, however, experience today is, of course, a enormous challenge for our entire human family. And it, it cu cuts across the entire globe. So it is different. However, I personally don't believe this is an extinction event. I think we, once again, we are hardwired and we will come out of this as a learning individuals and move forward in, in good ways. However, uh, on this question of platforms and leadership, I do believe that the, the coronavirus will burn off uh, before too long or in some time. Um, but we will be straight back to the fundamental problem for how we basically have structured uh, our economy since the times of Adam Smith. So in the last 100, 150 years, of course, the progress has been enormous. But we see that the very growth model, the way we have set ourselves up, has some very profound problems. And the one is the, the conflict between man and nature, the few and many, and the short and long term. Um, so the question is then, how do we address these systems problems, systemic problems, whether it's being the transport system, the healthcare system, the food system, etc. And the way we, the reason why we have put together, for example, Europe delivers with a number of world leading companies focusing on systems change in Europe or in India in the 2022 is the fact that we need unprecedented cooperation to basically be able to understand these systems challenges, identify the systems optionality, and then drive the transformation. These are very, very hard problems to solve. And as far as I can see, there are very few who can do this alone. Even the world's largest companies can't do it alone. So this very essence of cooperative leadership, leaders who are able to form action-based partnerships is an 
ingredients of quite enormous uh, uh, importance for us all over the short, medium and long term. Mm. And, and of course, one way to get traction uh, in, in this uh, change model that you describe and the need for change uh, is, is, of course, to work with different kinds, kinds of influencing platforms. Sinteo is one of them. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. So what we believe, uh, since our mission is to drive systems transformation at scale, is that we need to create platforms where people can come together. And uh, um, um, basically what we do is that we find a problem which is worthwhile working on. It could be the food system. It could be the transport system, the bioeconomy, et cetera. And then we look for exceptional leaders who can carry the torch and bring others with us. And then we put together a project. But you see, um, and we have a number of very exciting examples of huge progress in this space. But by and large, it is very difficult because we all have been trained to optimize the parts rather than transforming the system into something new. Mm. And I'm sure that my esteemed colleagues from Microsoft and others here on the on the call have a lot of experiences in both how to do that and also the challenges. Um, I think that, you know, if you if you look at some of the most remarkable companies, the top 15 companies in the last 25 years, they have all been, they're all great because they're able to drive systems transformation at scale via exceptional leadership. So this is a very, and also those companies outperform in the stock market. So it's really worthwhile fighting for, but it's not easy. Okay, good. Thank you, Oswald. Thank you. Great. So I think you picked up on a, a few themes there that we can continue with on the need for um, systems change and some of the problems, whether it's COVID or climate change, I think we need to see more engagement of the private sector. And um, Kimberly, earlier this year, Microsoft set some pretty tough, visionary, bold goals, really going for um, more of an exponential impact uh, with those targets um, than incremental. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what those targets are and, and how Microsoft sees these challenges? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. And, and, you know, speaking of the need to move systems, um, there's no question for any of us, I think, how very fundamental data is becoming and the growth within this sector and the oppor opportunity that it represents makes all of us a part of a, a really giant system with a giant opportunity to have an impact. And, and that's why it was so, um, wonderful to see Microsoft step forward. You know, I've been with the company four years. In my view, we've always been a company that is taken responsibility for moving the agenda forward also on climate. But I loved um, and, and so many of us felt so passionate and applauded when the company launched its very bold goals, took a real step, step up into what is uh, undeniably a very strong leadership position. Um, in our industry and across industries when we made our announcements. So those targets are, are around what we were already working to accelerate um, by 2025, getting our entire data center footprint, our entire company footprint over to 100% renewable energy. We're well on the way to doing the new bold ambitions that came in though, went well beyond that. So by 2030, we've committed to go carbon negative and that's with all three scopes included. So to go carbon negative will demand an awful lot of technological progress, but it uh, is, a, is a step on a journey to something much more ambitious indeed. And that is by 2050, we've made a commitment to pull back all of the carbon that we've ever put into the atmosphere uh, since our company's beginning, which was in 1975. And truth be told, um, we have a lot of smart people and our ecosystem is filled with an amazing amount of intelligence, but none of us yet know how we're gonna meet those goals. And so one of the things we also announced was a $1 billion climate innovation fund aimed precisely at doubling down and truly accelerating the answers to how we're gonna get to that truly deeply carbon negative um, opportunities. So that's gonna involve investments and discoveries that, uh, that the world uh, doesn't know yet, but uh, we're going to have to pursue them at pace to make this happen. 
Incredible. And in the beginning, um, when you, when you made your introduction, you mentioned the 50,000 partners that you're working with. Is there something in these goals that involve your broader ecosystem and in, in your, your different channels when it yeah. comes to sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the one of the ways that we transform or that we can provide leadership, make it make an impact is, of course, through that large ecosystem that we're a part of. And in fact, that ecosystem is there to lift companies. And we all see more and more how very closely technology and sustainability hang together. And so it's absolutely critical that we lift in a big way those technology-led agendas at companies, which also are in many ways their best levers to really go forward in terms of sustainability. And one example of a very broad collaboration, a systems-led approach, and an incredibly bold idea is this, uh, is this initiative we just launched within the last two weeks. It's, uh, it's that we're going to build something we call a planetary computer. And you should say, what on earth is a planetary computer? <laughs> said very shortly, it's a, it's a real ambition to bring the world's data together um, like it has never been brought together before. We have a cloud platform. We have all the artificial intelligence today to make an enormous dent in the problem. And if we put those to good use and try to consolidate, provide a consolidating platform where we take in lots of data, apply the best to it, satellite imagery, every kind of data you can imagine, and then provide those insights back out into the broader community, serving as an open platform for everyone to build on together. If we can do that, we can link together so many more of these very unanswered questions around what have you, biodiversity or man-made impact cause and effect that we so dearly need to understand better. So that's a, that's a bold idea that I, I'm, I'm delighted to be participating in building. Well, thanks to Microsoft for trail trailblazing through some of these bigger ex existential threats. Um, I think we're going to need much more collaboration. Um, time flies when you're having fun, and we're coming into the final minutes of the panel. So we thought we would just wrap up and come back to the Nordic theme and the, and the Nordic approach here and ask each of the panelists, what's the one piece of advice you would give to other leaders in do you think there's something special about the Nordics that can be exported to other parts of the world? And um, Kimberly, maybe we could just have a quick comment from you and we'll, we'll pass to the others. You're in a US company, but still very much showing the Nordic leadership in, in Norway. Is there one yeah. quick piece of advice you'd want to yeah. give? Well, my quick piece of advice, I would say, you know, we've made good progress as leaders, understanding where technology can take us. And so I would follow that if I, my advice to business leaders is to take that technology lens, everything you've learned about it, and then go one step farther and extend your next question to your teams as you work with them, to your ecosystem and say, how can that technology then take a step, a step change forward also on circular economy or on business processes, on sustainability. There's so much sustainable value lying in there if we follow that technology strand. And, and to the point about, um, things happening in the Nordics. It's been such a pleasure to actually um, be a part of serving up a whole lot of initiatives um, in our energy sector. That's one of the best examples where we see right across the Nordics, incredible innovation and an innovation that's way ahead of many other parts of the world. So we we have absolutely things to keep building on and, and this technology sustainability combination is truly powerful for us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Oswald, quick word from you or in the last, uh... 90 seconds here. Yeah, yes, uh, a very quick comment is uh, leadership. We have seen in the Nordics over years uh, leaders who have shown enormous courage and uh, enormous innovation in all our Nordic countries. And I think there's one piece of advice from me is to see this very moment we are in now as an unprecedented opportunity for renewal, innovation and new progress, a different kind of progress than what we have experienced before. And then I think the future will be pretty exciting. Thanks so much. Eva, over to you. Well, I think um, my biggest source of inspiration and uh, understanding of a system, a perfectly working system, complex uh, like no other, is nature itself. And to make sure that we protect nature and make sure that we learn from it. And biomimicry is a 
is a word that maybe more of a more or less everyone knows, but to actually apply that to business uh, in terms of collaboration, interconnectedness, and so forth. There, there's plenty to learn there. Super. And Henrik, are we on the right track here? Would you like to tie it up? <laughs> yeah, no, I th thank you to a great panel. I think uh, a lot of uh, positive uh, and forward-looking uh, uh, insights. Uh, I'm really proud of the contribution that you have given today. And, and I think that uh, it seems like we can all agree that uh, even if we're a tough crisis now at the moment, uh, this is actually uh, a springboard for, for uh, a new world and a new change and, and, and new thinking. And I think you have had some three really great examples of that today. So thank Thank you very much for a great panel and and uh thank you elaine as well thank you henry oh, okay. thanks everyone thanks have a great day thanks everyone thank bye